Hello, welcome back to the Venture Brothers podcast. This is one of your co-hosts, Ilana Levin, aka Ilana Brooklyn. I'm joined by my co-host, Stephen Adewell. Hello. We are the official Venture Brothers podcast of Graphic Policy Radio. Do you love the Venture Brothers cartoon, but are afraid of missing the myriad of historical references and layers of meaning behind each episode? Join pop culture history experts, me and Stephen, his secret identity is that he's an actual historian, uh, for our podcast examining each episode of season seven of the hit Adult Swim show. And today's episode is episode two of season seven, The War Qual Affair. Good God, what is what is War Qual, Stephen? Help me out. Uh, it's a kind of whale, which makes sense given what happens in uh, the episode. It's, um, I guess you would call it a red whale. Uh, that's what the original Norse uh, comes hmm. from. Red is usually not the color I most associate with whales, except for in really terrifying and sad circumstances. Well, you know, ancient Norse, maybe they got the colors. You know, it's a wine dark sea thing. Oof. So, we begin. Yeah, so it starts with uh, Gary slash Henchman 21 slash, uh, I forget what the Blue Morphos version of Kano was named. But it's Kano. Um, Okay, yeah. Um, Having a stress dream uh, where he is uh, naked and penisless in class uh, while all of the uh, villains that he had whacked in the previous season, uh, most significantly including the Wandering Spider who he killed in the Pine Barrens, um, uh, who comes up later. Um, And turns out that he is... uh, He overslept... And is running late, uh, and we get an extended sequence of him uh, smelling all of his clothes as he uh, determines his freshness levels. Yes, Uh, I actually just want to say real quick though about the dream. I mean, yeah, the stress dream is, um, you know, represents him feeling disappointed in himself because those were all different villains that were killed by the Blue Morpho. Um, right. And I think near yeah. the end of it, he says that his mom thinks that he's living with his uncle and thinks yeah. he's a good person. So I think that it's, it's a, it's a stress dream, but it's also a guilt dream. Yeah. Point of information. Uh, while the guild believes that the blue Morpho was out there assassinating guild villains, uh, right, like right now, we know that the monarch dressed as blue Morpho was generally just locking them up in his basement. The exception being wandering spider who Gary shot in the pine barrens. But nevertheless, those villains that they did lock up did end up dying because Maestro wave went crazy and started eating the other locked up villains. But first last season. So Gary is definitely right to feel guilty. Even if what happened isn't exactly as intentional as what the guild may believe to have been the case. Yeah. I mean, it's very much like he, you know, he's freaking out because like he is now living a triple life and he can't really take this. You know, he was not dealing well with the stress last season and, uh, it's only getting worse. I do want to, to, um, uh, highlight one thing that I almost didn't understand the first time around, Mm -hmm. uh, which is that when he goes down to the blue Morpho cave, the car is missing. Yes. And which is why he ends up, uh, on the path train, um, changing there, mm-hmm. uh, which, by the way, you know, please don't change on public transit. It's really not okay, <laughs> especially not on the path train, which is a very dignified transit system compared to the path train, of course, being the subway system that connects New Jersey to New York City. We've seen them riding it on it last season as well, which is why we know that the Jer- that the uh, New Jersey is where the Monarchs Manse is located. Some yeah. of the others that we encounter. Um, but it, that's really important given what happens when later in the episode um, he shows. By the way, should we keep saying Dr. Mrs. the Monarch or Sheila? Like, do you have a preference on this? I still still call her Dr. Mrs. the Monarch, but I think okay. we know that we're talking about the same person. And gotcha. yeah, guys, from here on out, spoilers, etc. But yeah, that the Morphomobile is, well, is, is missing. Well, and the cave is missing. cave is missing. Yeah, so like that, I didn't draw those things together i'm like oh shit that's why the blue morpho car shows up later um anyway so meanwhile at uh wide whales lair um this is where like i thought they did a really interesting thing with time in this episode where like 
bits of it are before last episode and bits of it are after and they don't really yeah. tell you which. Um, so here we see the Blue Morpho like threatening Wide Whale um, kind of doing his shtick and he doesn't realize that uh, Gary is, is running late and so like the big distraction isn't there. Um, and he does this like neat little trick with the, um, with the letter opener, which probably wouldn't have worked anyway, because usually letter openers are not that sharp, although, you know, it's a letter <laughs> opener belonging to a supervillain, so you never know. Um, look, but, anything in the hands of Bullseye is a lethal weapon. Right. But I mean, this is the monarch. He's, he's not exactly skilled in fisticuffs at the best of times. Um, and here the, the main fuck up is that he throws the, he catches it, which is really impressive, but he then throws it by the blade first, which is not how you throw knives. Duly noted. So relieved uh, you're familiar with these questions. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, I couldn't do it myself. I'm just saying I've seen videos of people. I see. It. I see. Um, meanwhile, at a local public school that I could not, um, uh, identify despite like freeze framing, mm -hmm. uh, Sheila is chairing a diff a difficult, uh, guild council meeting, uh, made all the more difficult by, uh, Phantom Limbs, like ongoing passive aggressive sabotage campaign. Yeah. He really is undermining her leadership. Um, you know, most of the uh, villains that we see in that crowd shot are people we've seen before, but not all of them. I do want to give another shout out for our purple friend in the baseball costume, who's definitely a reference to the Baseball Furies from the Warriors movie, one of my favorite movies. I was on a podcast to talk about it, actually. Uh, yeah. um, but I think like the woman with the electric lights around her head, I think she's new. Yeah, and she's definitely a reference to some sci-fi movie like i I've, I've seen that look before yeah. um i i did want to say one of my one of my favorite references i mean my favorite line from that scene is the the bit about you know i only have two skills brick throwing and frog being which is just <laughs> wonderful uh yeah. but my favorite reference was where he said you know what do you want me to do go work at tower records because i remember tower records um i mean i you know was closest to the uh, uptown one that was around um, Lincoln Center. But uh, Tower Records uh, is a New York original. It was founded mm -hmm. in uh, Midtown Manhattan uh, before going international. Um, and you can't get a job at the Tower Records anymore because it's both in the past and you're made out of plasma. Yes, I imagine being made of plasma uh, is, you know, makes a lot of job. Uh, efforts rather difficult um so like phantom limb seems to be basically trying to stir up uh the guild members into a lynch mob um whereas uh dr mrs is like trying to stop them from getting themselves killed because mm -hmm. like as far as she's concerned any of them could be the next target of the blue morpho because she yes. doesn't know who the blue morpho is and what he wants uh and then the red Death intervenes um, while the mob is deciding whether it wants to be a Dracula mob or a Frankenstein mob. <laughs> um, now, you caught the reference here and I didn't. So can yes. you walk me through this one? So a great, a great amount of this, of this episode is a Jaws reference. Um, and uh, when you, the moment where you see, you hear the sound of the crumpling styrofoam and the sound, it's from the crunching of the cup. And uh, that's totally from Jaws. There's so many Jaws moments in this episode. Um, that being one of the first, then he goes, I'll get it for you. Except he doesn't do it in a sailor right. voice like so, that. So the Red Death is taking on the role of... Uh, what's Shark Hunter, as it were. Yeah. Um, and which I guess makes Gary and Dr. Mrs. Uh, Brody and the other one. Well, Gary, as I point out, Gary's disguise when he is uh just waiting outside of the house i'm sorry right outside of venture tower like frantically trying to figure out what's what that's what richard dreyfus wears in jaws okay so he's he's richard dreyfus yes. and that makes dr mrs um brody because she gets slapped later on okay okay yep. now this is all making sense exactly all right uh so enough of and my she's brain. wearing black which yes he does okay um, so 
the next scene is uh, Wide Whale and Rocco discussing the Domino Mask and the Bruce Wayne problem, mm-hmm. which is one they've clearly figured out that it's the monarch because he's got bright red hair, enormous eyebrows, a giant nose, and like in reality, the Domino Mask is just a very bad, bad form of disguise, which you know, only exists these days in comic books because of conventions from the 1930s where um, pulp characters uh, dressed, you know, based on what people in the circus or vaudeville or, you know, early cinema were were wearing. Um, And I guess back in those days, um, a lot more people wore domino masks or maybe they were just... (laughs) there to like signify to the audience that someone's face is, is it's obscured. obscured. Yeah. It's a symbol. I think it primarily functions as a symbol. Right. Um, so they then, uh, the wide whale monologues, uh, the or his origin story and how it relates to Dr. Dugong, who it turns out his name is Dr. Doug Ong, which is da, just da, hilarious. Da. Um, so the story the folks is. Who don't remember? Yeah. Oh, sorry. They actually, they really do make it impossible for you for you to forget. Come to think of it. Yeah. Um, so, Doctor Dugong, who is also a deep cut from, uh, I think the, what is it, second or third season? I think it's third. Third season. Um, I mean, it's not as big of a deep cut as as last episode, but I did notice that it was like, okay, that's two episodes in a row that are both. Bi- both based on the idea of, like, this thing that you did way back when all of a sudden, you know, has consequences. Like, the yeah. the chickens are coming home to roost. You and that really was one of this. the most brutal things that had happened on the show to that point. We yeah. were like, holy fuck, he just showed up and killed a guy. And it was, it was definitely an escalation for the monarch, who had, yes. like, previously, like, really played by the guild rules. And, like that was part of what kind of made him distinctive as a villain is that like, he really got into the whole, you know, cat and mouse game thing. And so he sort of had this like almost, you know, psychotic break because he thought he was killing Dr. Venture. Um, so it turns out that, uh, wide whale is Dr. Dugong's brother, uh, from sort of the other side of the law. Uh, and this is where, uh, Ilana's art, background comes into play because it turns out that the wide whale stole Damien Hurst's the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. Explain this to me and our audience. Well, kids, the 90s were a crazy time. The British government did a lot of work investing in the arts locally. Uh, It decided it was going to rebrand the country of England as being a cool place. Uh, And in order to make that stick, they actually started to do things like fund the arts from music to visual arts. And it worked. Uh, It did great things for the economy. It would be cool if the American government did something like that also here for the sake of artists. Anyhow, um, in the 90s, there was a period, uh, early 90s, that was referred to the uh, YBA's Young British Artist, EBAS, if you're going to spell it out. And they were some of the biggest uh, successful artists from the 90s, art boom in, in, in British art. Particularly, it was a lot of artists doing conceptual art. And Damien Hirst was one of the big superstars of that, for better or worse. Um, And uh, a number of his pieces uh, were, are, uh, animals in formaldehyde preserved in giant tanks. Um, The tiger, this particular one is, yeah, it's a 15-foot tiger shark suspended in a tank of formaldehyde. It is absolutely immense. And it's like cross-section, right? No, it's not. It looks oh. that way because of the lines from the... Um, oh, okay. So it's just a solid shark. Yeah, it is just a shark suspended That's there. That's nuts. At some point, the shark began to deteriorate, partially because the gallery oh, had put bleach in the tank, sense. which is not what you're supposed to do. So then they took the shark out and stuffed it, but it didn't have the same... It just didn't look as menacing anymore. It, it didn't look as frightening. So he actually went and got a different shark to put in it. I would like to point out, both of these sharks were specifically hunted for the purpose of making art. I would like to point out that that's fucked up. Um, actually brings me back to one of my earlier points with regards to Jaws. Put a pin in that. Give me a moment. Um, but, uh, but so, yeah. So this piece of art was, you know, one of the most expensive contemporary pieces of art, actually, from the period. Millions of dollars. Um, it got famous in America uh, when it appeared in New York in 1997 for the Sensation Show, which was the Saatchi Gallery's huge show at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, which you guys might remember. 
I should remember because it was the famous art exhibition that was menaced by my arch nemesis, then Mayor Rudy Giuliani. He, uh, he tried to censor the art show because he didn't understand some of the conceptual art there and decided it was anti-Catholic and it wasn't. Uh, or the conception of the First Amendment for that matter. Yeah, no, he, there's all kinds of things Giuliani doesn't understand. I, it's like the First Amendment, yes, yes, but let me also tell you why you're wrong about art. It's very, very much my way to respond to things and lets the constitutional scholars do their things. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the, the piece got really famous in America around then. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's such a great New York even though this is a piece of art that's highly identified with London and with that scene, as a New Yorker, it also has a lot of resonance for that reason. Um, a number of Hearst's works of animals in formaldehyde have been vandalized and I, or, or commented on via paint is another way of looking at it. Um, I actually thought that the shark had been uh, vandalized, but I, it wasn't actually. It was a number of his other works that had been. So that is the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. Um, and okay. apparently if you're standing in front of it, it is just tremendously scary and overwhelming. And yet well, that, you're aware that it's dead and you are not. Right. Well, that, I mean, it works perfectly on any number of levels, right? Because number one, it continues the whole Jaws riff, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, two, it's absolutely perfect that the villain, the wide whale, like steals it because it's the most expensive piece of art around Mm -hmm. And therefore the best, right? Yes. That's his mentality. Whereas his brother, and I, I have to say, I find Dr. Dugong's voice really distracting. because It's, it's so like insufferable. So clearly Jimmy Stewart <laughs> impression. Um, as a scientist is like, no, this this is not useful for my genetic experiments. Um, I want to just say one last thing about Jaws. Mm-hmm. Jaws is an amazing movie, and people should absolutely watch it. Um, Jaws is a movie that I would argue had a negative effect on the world, other than being a really excellent movie. This is not Steven Spielberg's fault, right? But, you know, Jaws' vast success really is the birth of the blockbuster movie as a, as a thing in and of itself that really ended an era of greater experimentation in, in Hollywood films. And the other piece of it is it really helped... Uh, stir up a sort of shark paranoid mania. Uh, there started to be more people freaking out shark about week. sharks and shark hunting became a bigger thing. Now, lots of sharks are endangered. Guess what? We really need sharks. They're very important in the ecosystem. So, um, but I do think it's a wonderful film. Go watch it. But sharks are our friends. Sharks are very good. Okay. So, um, we then, speaking of sharks, we go to our next uh, Jaws reference, yes. where it turns out that uh, all of the people who've been stirred up uh, against the Blue Morpho slash sharks um, have caught um, the Blue Morpho, but it turns out it's the wrong guy. This harkens back to Jaws, where they catch a shark, which is not the actual Jaws. Yep. Uh, now, the place that they've taken this um, strung up Blue Morpho to, uh, is in turns out a real place. It is Rat Island in the Bronx, uh, which uh, is a privately owned island that uh, use has a very disturbing history as a uh, typhoid uh, hospital. Um, so um, yeah, I had never heard of Rat Island before. It's very, that, that they they did their research there. Yeah, so uh, in this scene, in addition to, like, the stringing up of the blue morpho is the stringing up of the shark. Um, There's another beast piece from, from Jaws there, which right. is in Jaws, they have the fake, when, they, when, when somebody calls out, you know, after they've had, oh, this is a fake, this isn't the, this isn't the actual Jaws, this is another shark. They have the widow of one of the people who was killed um, come up and slap the, 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 the uh, and, and bleh. oh my gosh, is it, do they slap? Right. The mayor or Brody? They slap Brody. Well, then she's definitely Brody. Um, slap Brody, uh, yes. In the uh, by wh and by Brody we mean Doctor Mrs. the Monarch, um, blaming her for not having caught the shark by that point in time. Or in this case, lying about uh, who killed the wandering spider. Indeed, indeed. Because um, one of the more difficult parts of of Doctor Mrs. Job is that like she's been the one who has to deal with all of the fallout of the Blue Morphos uh, somewhat accidental campaign of uh, villain slaying. Um, yeah. 
because seemingly she's the only one on the guild council who actually does any work, which is not surprising. Yeah, I mean, she's the only woman, so obviously she's the only person who does any work. Gotcha. Now, we go back to uh, our friends on Manhattan Island. We find out that Rocco, our resident creep, has not been keeping up on his video game technology and thinks that Serena totally wants to play with a Nintendo. Um, yeah. I suspect she probably wasn't even playing video games on her computer, but regardless. <laughs> um, it, also, it he sort of continues his like streak of weird Madonna horror complex stuff because like after having just like, you know chortled it up with his boss about an old girlfriend who used to be into bondage. Like he immediately freaks out at the thought of Serena getting tied down when she was clearly talking metaphorically about like not being allowed out of her room. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's some psychology going on with him. Yeah. I kind of, as we were saying before the episode, uh, before we start recording, like this is the one running gag with with Rocco and Serena that like I wish they'd wrap up because it's kind of one note and it's annoying me. Well, Serena does have a the Smith sticker on her laptop. Yes, that was good. Um, which probably means that she's going to have a lot of feelings about this and about I, other things. I would just like her to beat him to death, basically. That could happen. That yeah. could happen. I mean, it's that kind of show. Um, speaking of sort of <laughs> calling out the patriarchy. Um, the, I love that the, like, moment that, uh, Sheila gets told about what, uh, the monarch and Gary have been up to, that, like, she immediately calls out the kind of, uh, macho bullshit, you know, reaction to, um, you know. To her success. Yeah. She basically says that you were frightened. Wait, so Monarch was frightened of my success and therefore he had to go make himself feel like a big, exciting person by being the blue morpho. Oh my gosh. I, I was wondering when they were going to have her find out. I felt like it was, seemed implausible to me that she would go for so long without figuring it out because she is probably the smartest person in the series when it comes to just like normal, like, yeah, they've done Deduct a lot deductive of... Deductive reasoning, being practical. She's like the smartest person along those sort of axes in the show, yeah. so... I mean, they've done a lot of work in the previous season to kind of, like, lead her down false, you know, dead ends. Yeah. Um. So it kind of makes sense that uh, this is, like, the one direction that she wouldn't go down. Um. So the one thing that, like, I almost completely missed at this point is when Gary tries to show her the Morpho cave and like explain that, yeah, he really was, uh, the monarch's dad. This is a real thing. This is not just playing pretend. Um, the Morpho cave is no more. It's seemingly vanished, uh, which seems incredibly significant given the post credit sequence, uh, because it turns out the blue Morpho, a uh, car is being driven around by someone who looks a lot like the Blue Morpho and who might actually be the Blue Morpho. Mm-hmm. Um, and you called out the particularly uh, venturous nat- venture, uh, rusty venture-ish nature of the stress stream that the monarch has while he's uh, unconscious after having his head beat by the wide whale. Yeah, and like this is really interesting because, um, I mean, there's been speculation for a long time that uh, Rusty and um, the Monarch are related because, like, they're both redheads, they both have very uh, pointy noses, like, their features are quite similar, and we know that their dads used to be swingers back in the day, so, like, it's not impossible that, um, you know, both of them could be Morphos, both of them could be Venture Brothers, that would be another meaning mm. for the whole show, because you know the monarch and and uh, and Rusty have been you know in the show from the beginning, so they could be conceptually the Venture uh, Brothers. The Venture Brothers. Yeah, this this moment. I mean, you you had articulated thoughts about the relation before, and we're more on board with that theory than I am. But for some reason, this particular stress stream, I'm just yeah, I'm I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it more than I was before. Yeah, um, and we then, um... 
We have the, oh, yes, yeah. there's the OSI shell company. Um, they're excited to have an excuse to go to an OSI shell company and beat up some people. In this case, the shell company is called the Dummy Corporation, and by which they literally mean Dummy Corporation. A Dummy Corporation is a fake corporation you set up to do as a cover-up or to conceal something for spycraft. In this case, it's Dummy spelled D-U-M-M-I-I. Uh, the building's architecture was really nice. I kind of think it's Rockefeller Center because I noticed they had a globe coming in through the side. But all those files are in the basement in old style bins. Gotcha. Um, I have to admit, I was totally distracted by the discussion where it turns out that the wide whale, uh, he of the sort of pseudo mafia, uh, you know, voice and aesthetic uh, for as long as we've known him, turns out to have been fake Italian. Um, and just sort of putting it on ever since he did a work study trip. Uh, oh, he's lying about that work study oh, trip. Oh, I'm sure he is, but you know. He just wants to like be this mafia stereotype. There's so many fake Italian dudes, it's like not even funny. So that's really a lot of fun to see them call one of them out. Um, it's and it was thing. also like it's a great moment of like Rocco and uh, the monarch like just tearing the, sh- you know tearing a strip off this guy yeah i I think it's a reminder of how charming the monarch can be yeah and in some ways like his greatest strength is in sort of verbally tearing down people and sidetracking them yes you know he um you know as opposed you know because he's not a great fighter he's he's not the best strategist he's not the best scientist uh, but man, he can like seriously sidetrack you. Uh, someone who can't be sidetracked is the Red Death. Uh, <laughs> it's so true. God, I. Sorry, you you had a good note about this. Just yeah, like bringing back in the sort of Norman Rockwell meets the Red Skull aesthetic is a very yeah. He's just like you know that kid was like super sweet, and it, it's like the more normal they make him outside of his his uh, day job the more terrifying like that's more terrifying to me than when he's got the scythe and he's he's you know Reaping. murdering yeah osi agents by the by the handful because like it's just there's something really wrong about the way that that clashes clancy brown is just a jaw-droppingly talented voice actor in this show oh in, yeah in general he's just an amazing talent and i mean it's pretty clear that like most of this script was written for him just like, yeah. let's let's give him some monologues. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. So they agree to work together. Um, they actually, I love this. This is another Jaws, another uh, Jaws reference. Whoa, we're not there yet. No? Oh. Um, yeah, we're a little bit out of sequence here. Oh, so, yes, we are. Yeah, so uh, Gary and uh, Dr. Mrs. have like a really awkward car conversation as they're waiting for the Red Death to finish uh, attacking the OSI shell company, um, which I read in some pieces online, they were suggesting that it's like, uh, that the awkwardness was due to the fact that, like, Gary and Dr. Mrs. haven't talked a lot since Gary, like, confessed to being in love with her um, many seasons back. But I I think it's more that just, like, she's pissed at him because, you know, he... Uh, enabled her husband to do some really shitty stuff that yeah. she's now having to clear up. Um, like, he's trying to act normal, and she's like, I can't act normal. And then when they're talking later, she's doing this thing that I think a lot of people who are harmed are forced to do, which is to perform that everything is okay so that you're not the bad guy. Yeah. Um, you know, she doesn't want to be seen as the bad guy. She doesn't want to be the stick in the mud. So she's going to try to, when she talks to him later, she's like, I like cool playlists. Because she like, she can't afford to be seen as uh, a jerk, even though she has every right to be hurt and violated, to feel hurt and violated. Right. Um, and then, you know, brief interlude with Rocco wanting to do Mad Libs, which, oh. you know, personally I think is a really effective form of torture. Uh, <laughs> we then get the scene where uh, Gary, the Red Death, and, Sh- and Dr. Mrs. Sheila are competing over superstitions, which... No, no, no. Well, Gary and Red Death are competing over superstitions. I think she mentions one of them. I don't believe she does. She's going to the filing cabinet, but I think she says, like... She says they're superstitious, and he's like, oh, I'll show you superstitious. So this whole scene is straight out of Jaws again. There's that famous scene where they compare scars with each other. And then at the end of... It's just a really 
go Google it, people, for Christ's sake. Um, at the end of the sequence where the different men on the shark hunt compare scars with each other, uh, they get the story of the USS Indianapolis um, from truly the uh, grittiest of all of the gritty men, which is Quint, which is Robert Shaw's character. And he was on the USS Indiana- Indianapolis really horrific story of the sailors who survived and how most of them were actually eaten by sharks. And apparently it's a true story. Mm -hmm. And um, that is sort of the parallel, I think, for uh, Red Death's incredibly lengthy monologue is that there also was a similarly incredibly lengthy, brutal, disturbing monologue given by Robert Shaw. And I just thought of one more. Oh, God, the damn... Venture Brothers got me again. Do but tell. yet another parallel. So, in addition to like the whole thing of like, oh my god, the Red Death was at movie night on Gargantua One. That's like a the big reveal of the model. A big yeah. reveal, and it's sort of the biggest thing that kind of ties together these two episodes, which mm-hmm. are supposed to be a two part. But what is the name of the movie that was a movie night? Sharky's Machine. Shark. Yep. Ease yep. yep. Machine. God damn it! Like, yeah. that's the dumbest possible pun, but it's like, you know, surrounded by so much, like, amazing mythology and callbacks and whatnot that I did not process why it was Sharky's machine and why all of the Jaws references this have... Oh, my God, I'm just... Like, I, I feel that that same admiration and disgust that, like, when someone rips off a really good pun it's like that um well i think that you and i should pledge at some point to watch sharky's machine yeah because I, remember them them citing that movie predates them coming up with various jaws references right yeah i th- i think that's like clearly they were like okay you know th- they've got their like big whiteboard and they're like you know okay sharky's machine that's clearly a big thing for this season sharks let's yeah. do something with sharks okay jaws we can do this yeah and like um, Doc, Doc Cameron being a former art student is definitely like, and that's why we're going to have a conversation about Damien Hurst. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that I, I think it would be worth it for us to check out the movie sometime and just sort of see if there's anything to it. Sure. Well, you know, who's not up for a Burt Reynolds uh, thriller, <laughs> police thriller from the seventies. I mean, it sounds like my idea of a, it really doesn't, but I'll do it anyway for science. Um, so then we have Sheila calling out and knocking out a sexist guard Two sexist uh, guards. Two, two sexist guards, as Gary pretends to be an elevator attendant in front of Hank, who, of course, doesn't notice anything. You pointed out about the uh, the um, the the pizza. Oh, yes. It turns out I was completely wrong. It was a great mislead from last episode that the guards who Hank thinks were knocked out by his poison pizza were, in fact, knocked out by Dr. Mrs. Um and I need to go back and check if in last episode there is uh, Gary, like, with his back turned to the camera, pretending to be an elevator attendant. I'm going to bet there is. And then one of those uh, whale lice guards um, describes Dr. Mrs. as being Ilsa, she-wolf of the, S- uh, she-wolf of the SS, which is indeed an actual uh, exploitation movie from 1975 of... Um, the most dreaded Nazi of them all, so committed to crimes so terrible, even the SS feared her. You know, I somehow don't think that that's true, but okay. I mean, yeah, I, I think it was a, more of an excuse for, for sort of Nazi fetish. Oh, yeah, no, that's the point yeah. of the whole genre. Which, you know, um, I have to say, like, it, it's kind of a weird way in which they're, like, calling, like, hanging a lampshade off their own stuff. Well, at the same time, kind of calling it out a little bit. Yeah, because... it's true because her outfit does reference that. Oh yeah, does. I mean, ever since yeah. she became, she got on the guild council. Like she, mm-hmm. her, she's got this like, you know, pseudo uh, SS kind of thing going on. But the most important thing you need to know about Elsa Shewolf of the SS is that the movie poster comes with the following warning: Some members of the public may find certain scenes of this film offensive and shocking. Dash dash the management. Anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we then cut back to like, this is where we, we now bookend back to last episode where uh, Hank is uh, been handed the gun and is told to uh, shoot the monarch. Uh, and this is where we get like, 
another great line in this episode where, you know, the moniker's just like, you know, why is Hank dressed up like a gigolo? And he's just, <laughs> I dressed myself as a juggalo. <laughs> so gigolo, juggalo. I, in case folks are not aware... And God bless you if they're not. Juggalos are a uh, a musical subculture um, dedicated to their profound love of the 90s horror shock hip hop band, the Insane Clown Posse. They have uh, every year they have a big festival. It's a it's a it's a very focused subculture. There's actually a book about him by um, Nathan Rabin called I think it's like You Don't Know Me But You Hate Me. Anyway. Um. Yeah, so uh, Gary manages to uh, Hank Whisper Hank uh, <laughs> due to the fact that he was um, in uh, Hank's weird little temporary um, bank robbing group. So he knows Enrico Matassa, um, you know, very closely. <laughs> um, and then we get the most unexpected, like, author's ass pull that I've seen on this show in quite some time, where uh, the Red Death comes in to reveal that Dugong lives. It's the guy whose head was blown off with a laser cannon thing is in fact alive because he has starfish DNA and starfish do regrow limbs. Um, when they're cut off, uh, one time I actually saw two starfish next to each other in a tank. One of them had six limbs. One of them had four. And I had to wonder if one of the limbs had been stolen and taken by the others and that they needed to be reapportioned for equity's sake. Uh, yeah. Um, I'll say the one anecdote I know about starfish, which is kind of gross, but apparently they occasionally get a disease that causes them to tear off their own limbs. Oh no, that might've happened is, to that one starfish I saw. It's possible, which is just, ugh. um, that gets me in a really like, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Stop. Let's moving along. Deep sense. So it all then devolves into this weird family, awkward farce where like Dr. Dugong is pissed that wide whale doesn't read their mom's emails because apparently he's been alive for some time. Um, the wide whale for some bizarre reason decides to pretend that like it's all a version of like charades mixed with hide and go seek. Yeah. He doesn't want his brother to know he's a seriously evil motherfucker. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, Ventec tower comes to life. Like it's a goddamn ghostbusters movie. <laughs> Roll credits. And then, yes. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, the original Blue Morpho car shows up, uh, piloted by, I'm guessing, the Blue Morpho, question mark? I think it could be Rusty, maybe, in disguise. I'm not sure. Or, I mean, it looked a little big to be rust, like, across the shoulders. Yeah. Um, Another possibility, it could be Vendata. Right. The theory that people have. Yeah, from, when was that? Season five, season six? Season six. Okay. Okay, so... To go back into last season uh, for a second, uh, during an OSI uh, stakeout mission, um, uh, wait, why am I blank? Brock beat the living crap out of uh, Vendata to like steal his costume so they could get into a villain club. Um, and it's possible that that rebooted Vendata's memory which if we're right about who Vendata is, is possible that, um, uh, the Monarch and possibly Rusty question mark, Mm -hmm. uh, Stad is, um, still alive. And given that like a lot of last episode was all about like, you know, fail safes that Jonas venture had set up. If something were to happen to him, It's possible that, like, you know, he had another setup with uh, the Blue Morpho that, like, hey, you know, if I die and my disembodied head um, possesses a building in midtown Manhattan and goes crazy, like, you know, that's possible, too. Uh, Because this is the Venture Brothers, Mm -hmm. where anything is possible. 
Um, and just in, you know, Vendetta himself was, of course, like a recall to RoboCop. And RoboCop was, you know, originally a cop a, who fought corruption. So, like, and the movie's climax does deal with him kind of regaining some, um, some sense of his memories. So, could be. I, I actually also really enjoyed, I forgot to put this down, there's a great joke during the, this, la- this final scene before the credits roll um, where Hank admits that Hank has lost track of the plot as to why he's there in the first place dressed as Enrique Montasa. Yeah. Uh, it does kind of put things in proportion, doesn't it? It's yes. Like, okay. So I think like at the end of this, when you know you have yet again, Red Death comes in and solves a problem through means other than violence. I mean, it's true he killed various OSI officers brutally earlier. But the show has a tendency to build up pain points and conflict and then just ease it off in a very painless fashion. And I just, I really want Red Death to do something seriously evil at the end of, se- of this season, by the end of the season, or I'm going to be disappointed. I just yeah, I I mean, want to see him do something really fucked up. They're definitely building him up. I mean, in this episode, he was given a motivation for like, why does he do anything? And here, like, he wants to move up in the guild hierarchy and... He wants a pension. So I feel like that could go one of two ways. Like that could either go the direction of he does something really awful in order to, you know, promote himself through dead men's shoes. Or it could be a, uh, you know, one day left till retirement kind of subversion. Hmm. Maybe. But I just want the stakes to be raised. I don't want the stakes to be deflated. Mm. I, I just need that right now on the show. Um. I want to quickly do some corrections from last episode. Uh, it was the Exorcist 1, not Exorcist 2. And we should have specifically mentioned that the cold temperatures were also tied to specific plot points in the Exorcist 1 as well. So bringing that back, shout out to my loyal spouse who watched way too many horror movies his entire life. Um, what, do you, what were your overall okay. thoughts about this episode? Um, yeah, I really liked it. So... You know, as I sort of said, like, I think what they're going for this season is um, this idea about your past actions, like, coming back on you and the need to, like, actually deal with, you know, the consequences of what Mm -hmm. you've done. Um, So that's kind of what, you know, my guess is. Now I'm usually wrong about these sorts of things. No, I think you're right. Um. Well, it just, what can I say? The show tends to zag when I think it, it's going to zig. So, um, but like, did you feel like it was a good episode? I feel like I watched this episode twice uh, in a row, actually, more or less. And I felt like I actually liked it more on the second viewing, which is a nice thing. Uh, yeah, I liked it a lot. I mean, you know, it, it had some really good uh, monologues, uh, had some good character work. It moved the plot forwards. Uh, a lot of people sort of finding out information that yes. you know has been withheld for them mm-hmm. for some time, which is, you know, that's a thing with me. I, I think, you know, those kind of plots are fine, but eventually you need to, to actually fire it off and, you know, let all the information out. So mm-hmm. we'll, you know, I'm definitely looking more forward to next week than I was previously. So, yeah. Well, thank you again. Um, Stephen, where can our listeners find you on the internet? So, uh, they can find me at Stephen Atwell on, uh, Twitter, or they can find me on Tumblr or, uh, WordPress at Race for the Iron Throne. How do you spell your name? Uh, A-T-T-E-W-E-L-L and Stephen with a V. Yay. As for me, I'm on Twitter all the time. I should probably stop. E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn is my Twitter handle. Best way to reach me. This podcast is brought to you by Graphic Policy Radio, um, I'll definitely be doing some more comics-focused episodes again in the near future. Uh, And graphicpolicy.com is our website. And this podcast will be on our other platforms as well, definitely on iTunes um, and on blog talk radio. I'll be uploading it there. I'm recording it actually on TriCast, which seems to be giving me better sound quality, which means that we're no longer live, but I think that the payoff is a better sound quality is, is really worth it. So thank you guys. Hopefully this begins an era of greater and greater sound. Excellent. And with that, go, go Team, team Ven- Venture, Venture Podcast. Podcast. Hey. 
Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.